Patricia Ortiz, age 31, lived in La Grande, California with her husband Israel Ortiz. La Grande is located in California's Central Valley between Fresno and Sacramento. It has a population of 1,800 citizens. The couple has three children, Anna Ortiz Lara, age 8, Mateo Ortiz Lara, age 5, and Alexa Ortiz Lana, age 3. The children attend La Grande Elementary School. Anna loved to sing at church. Mateo was protective of his sisters and loved to run. Alexa was known for having a beaming smile. The family lived at the La Grande Apartments at 13171 East Bryce Street. On January 12th Israel Ortiz was arriving home. As he entered the home he discovered what no father should ever see. His three children were all dead, and his wife was injured. Neighbors could hear him screaming for help. Police and ambulances arrived shortly later and described the scene as one of the most gruesome scenes in their careers. Patricia was found in a bathtub full of water with self-inflicted wounds to her wrists. Patricia was transported to the hospital to receive treatment for her injuries then later booked into the Mercer Ed County Jail on three counts of murder. Authorities are not releasing exactly how the children died but all three children had been dead for hours. Patricia Ortiz could face the death penalty. Ortiz was assigned a public defender. During a video conference Ortiz was ordered not to have any contact with the children's father. She's scheduled for her arraignment hearing on February 4th. A longtime friend of Patricia Ortiz's, Carla Gonzalez, said, she was in a dark place. She went through a lot of mental health issues in the past. It has been going on for months. MCSO deputy and spokesperson Daryl Allen said the community was in shock over such violence. The Grand is a very small town, it's a very tight-knit town. I can tell you that from living here for a long time. This whole town, I'm going to call it a family, everybody in this town knows everybody. So when something like this happens it affects everybody. This is going to affect this town. He continued, this is a very stressful time for everybody, especially family members. It's a farming community, so everybody in this town, they all go to the football games, they all go to the baseball games, we all go to the same school. A GoFundMe was set up to help Israel Ortiz, the children's father, cover the funeral expenses. So far more than $55,000 has been donated. <music> Tiffany Stevens, age 27, had a history of paranoia and suicidal thoughts for years. She also had a history of depression, anxiety and postnatal depression. Tiffany's father died of a drug overdose when she was just five years old. As she grew into a teenager she also overdosed on drugs, nearly dying. Doctors at that time thought she may suffer from bipolar disorder. But an assessment from a psychiatrist found she had a borderline personality disorder and not bipolar. Tiffany was placed in a care home when she was just 11 years old. She developed a strong mistrust in authority. By the time she was 18 she spent the majority of her time googling conspiracy theories, which heightened her paranoia. She often discussed how the world was corrupt. Tiffany had two young children, Casey Lee Taylor, age 3, and Darcy Stevens, age 18 months. Tiffany asked her grandmother if she could sew microphones into Casey Lee's dress so she could hear what the teachers were saying to her at the nursery. Tiffany was referred to mental health services on eight occasions but failed to respond each time. Tiffany moved out of her mother's home when social workers felt the home was not safe for the children. She moved into her own apartment on Arthur Street in Bolton. Bolton is a town in Greater Manchester, in the northwest of England. It has a population of approximately 141,000 people. After moving into her own place she distanced herself from social workers, and was terrified they were going to come take her children away. 
Tiffany vowed that if the social services or the police visited her home she would kill herself and her two children. In early December Tiffany made a suicide pact with a friend, and both met at a lodge to carry out their plans. However the friend backed out saying she didn't know children would be involved, so Tiffany put her plans on hold. On January 21 in 2019 Tiffany's brother dropped by to check on his sister and nieces. He knocked but nobody would answer. He decided to break in through the back door. He found a disturbing scene. Tiffany was lying on a mattress on her living room floor. Beside her under a duvet was the body of little Casey Lee. Next to both bodies sit cups containing a bright green liquid, an empty pack of painkillers, a melted lollipop, syringes, and a bottle of orange juice. Little one-year-old Darcy was also lifeless in her pram, next to the door. All three were dead. A note was found on Tiffany's phone reading, I've chosen to kill us for my children's best interest. A coroner's inquest found that Tiffany unlawfully murdered her children with drugs then killed herself in the same manner. She had given her children massive amounts of methadone, a powerful heroin, and opioid substance, then took a massive amount herself. None of these drugs had been prescribed to Tiffany. When Casey Lee's body was examined it was determined she had been given methadone, and had been also injected in her abdomen with insulin. Darcy died from an amount of methadone enough to prove fatal to an adult. Tramadol and morphine was also found in all three. When Tiffany's grandmother, Bobby Jo Stevens, Asked Dr. Lum at the coroner's inquest if any of them suffered he responded that all three would have been unconscious before death and said, I don't think there would have been any pain or suffering. The inquest discovered that although both children were known to social services, there were no grounds or hint of either child to be removed from the, their mother's care. Raquel Wilkins, age 40, was recently engaged to Christopher Browning, father of her baby boy, Denzel Browning Wilkins, age 2. Raquel attended the University of South Florida where she obtained a degree in psychology. She was a teacher at Durant High School prior to moving to California. The family decided to go to a Padres game at Petco Park. Before the game the couple decided to have some food from a third-level concourse which housed picnic tables. At around 4 p.m. on September 25 in 2021 police were called to Petco Park advising that a woman and her baby fell from the six-story concourse. Ambulances and police were dispatched to the scene where efforts were made to resuscitate the woman and child, but the two were already deceased. The mother and child were pronounced dead just moments before the baseball game between the San Diego Padres and the Atlanta Braves began. According to witnesses, Wilkins was jumping on picnic tables and fell off once nearly falling from the six-story building but surprisingly got back up and began jumping again with her son in her arms. When she fell this time she fell over the railing and to her death, taking her two-year-old son with her. At first, the San Diego police stated the deaths appeared suspicious. After conducting numerous interviews with eyewitnesses and video footage they changed their stance. Raquel Wilkins' death has been classified a suicide and Denzel Browning Wilkins' death has been classified a homicide, San Diego Police Department Lieutenant Andrew Brown. The detectives conducted a thorough and comprehensive investigation that included dozens of interviews, reviewing of available video footage, and collecting background information to determine what led to the deaths, Brown continued. Investigators made the conclusion with the San Diego County Medical Examiner, Brown said. Dan Gillian, the attorney representing Wilkins' parents and sisters disagreed, and accused the city of trying to downplay responsibility. The city owns 70% of the ballpark, while the Padres own 30%. The family intends to file a wrongful death lawsuit against the city and Petco Park. The city doesn't want to explain why it concluded that a young mother would kill her only child, at an event where witnesses said she was happy, he continued, to me, 
the city is acting like any other defendant in a lawsuit, blame the victim, especially if they are not able to defend themselves. Eyewitness, Catherine Benson Byling, said she was about 10 feet away from the family, and was shocked by what she saw. She said, I keep reliving it and reliving it, she said, and still can't figure out how exactly it happened. Billing said the woman appeared to be happy, jumping and bouncing her toddler. She said the mother jumped onto a picnic table bench while holding her toddler. She lost her balance and fell, then jumped right back up and within seconds fell over the waist-high railing. She said everyone was in shock, it just happened so fast. Attorney Gillian said it was extraordinarily dangerous and stupid that picnic tables had been so close to the railing. Like any other property owner the city is required to keep people safe on its property. In 2016 Raquel Wilkins obtained an order of protection against her then-boyfriend, claiming he choked her then hit her in the mouth with his cell phone as well as other abuse. The boyfriend denied the allegations and responded with a sworn declaration saying, this order was filed against me by a person who has a documented history of suicidal and psychotic behavior and a history of compulsive lying. Attorney Dan Gillian said that he's not surprised that somebody who is angry at somebody else is going to try to make that person look crazy. Funeral arrangements were not made known to the public. When a parent can kill their children it has to be one of the worst things imaginable. Where does a child turn when the person they run to for protection is the one killing them? We must do better as a society. Don't ignore warning signs. If someone has a history of mental illness, threatens suicide, or living in isolation, do something. You could be the difference between life and death. Every 90 minutes someone commits suicide in the UK. In the United States someone commits suicide every 31 seconds. It's the most common cause of death for people under the age of 35, more common than cancer or vehicle accidents. Men are three times more likely to commit suicide than women. It's sometimes uncomfortable for people to discuss suicide, however it's important to take notice. Suicidal thoughts can be quite common in those suffering from personality disorders. If you find yourself with a friend or relative threatening to harm themselves, it's best to bring the person to your local emergency department, or contact the suicide hotline for your area. Here are some tips if you live with someone suffering from borderline personality disorders. Offer ongoing support. Living with someone with a significant mental health issue can be exhausting for the person, so always be understanding and offer a supportive hand when needed. Validate their feelings. Let them know you understand how they feel. Listen and show empathy for what they are going through. Get educated on borderline personality disorders. Gaining an understanding of how borderline personality disorders affect people is very important. It helps you understand about their behaviors and how you can better support them. Help them with their treatment plan. Having coping skills is useful, and being a part of helping them with those coping skills can help you gain trust as well as an understanding of what helps the person you care about. Always stay calm and consistent. When you are dealing with someone whose emotions may be unstable, it's best to remain constant and consistent. If you become upset or angry it's more likely you will trigger their disorder, causing outbursts. Learn about what triggers them. When you are around someone long enough you will eventually learn what triggers them, and what can help calm them. Try to avoid things that trigger your loved one. Be trustworthy. When you tell your loved one something, try to always be honest and stick to your word. Help build a positive and healthy relationship. This creates a safe and loving environment. Remind them of their positive traits. Someone with borderline personality disorder may struggle with their self-image. Try to remind them of the things they can do well and what traits you enjoy about them. Familiarize yourself with mental health services. All mental illness is best treated with formal mental health care, 
So familiarize yourself with the different types of care, such as outpatient therapy, intensive outpatient, and inpatient treatment. Keep a suicide hotline number handy where your loved one can call it at any time if needed. That concludes this episode. Keep your eye out for the next volume, coming soon. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing. Thanks for watching. Want to help support the channel you love, and get something in return? Simply purchase some Elizabeth's Chronicles merch. We have coffee mugs, t-shirts, sweatshirts, cozy blankets, beach towels, phone covers and more. Use the coupon code EC10OFF4U and get 10% off your order. The link to order is in the description area below this video. Thanks for helping Elizabeth's Chronicles continue to make the videos you love.